So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the um, IRSS Symposium at SOE. Uh, the topic of the uh, talks today is going to be on keratoconus management. Uh, what are the options now? So we're going to be reviewing some of the pathogenesis of keratoconus and uh, showing some conventional techniques for keratoconus that are currently ongoing and some future new exciting development in keratoconus management, which is going to be happening in, in the near and immediate uh, future. So without a further ado, I'd like to first invite our first speaker, who's going to be Tamir Gali, my co-chair of this session, who's going to be talking about keratoconus uh, pathogenesis. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you for attending our ISRS symposium today. Again, the symposium will be about keratoconus. And keratoconus is a very common disease. Uh, at least in our area. So, uh, the classical definition of keratoconus is that it's an ectatic corneal dystrophy which have affecting the central and inferior paracentral part of the cornea. And this causes a high degree of irregular astigmatism. It's mostly bilateral, although you can find rarely unilateral cases, and it's usually early, earlier in one eye. So, about 60% of the cases are bilateral, but 40% of the cases can show uh, one eye affecting before the other. Usually it affects uh, people in the second decade. There is no sex differences between uh, males and females. And factors affecting the progression and stabilization are not well known till now, or not fully known. It increases with the contact lens users and ultraviolet ray exposure. That's why it's very common in the area I'm working in, in the Middle East. And it increases with eye rubbing. And there is uh, a very uh, upcoming uh, uh, theory about that uh, decreasing the rubbing might decrease the progression of keratoconus. So, usually in the textbooks, you'll find that it is a little bit rare, but I'll tell you that it is not that much rare. It's mostly sporadic. There is chromosomal related to keratoconus somehow, and genome uh, exploration of the uh, part of the uh, uh, chromosomes which affecting people with uh, keratoconus are ongoing. A true hereditary transmission are reported. Family history accounts for about 6 to 10% of the cases. And familial or environmental association are very common, but it's not well uh, established. There is a lot of association uh, with some ocular diseases, as you can see in this slide. Uh, Werner keratoconjunctivitis, conjunctivitis, aniridia, blue sclera, ectopia lentis, and as well systemic association like Turner, Down, ehler danlos syndromes, Marfan, and atopy. So usually the patient of keratoconus comes complaining of vision, deterioration of the vision in one eye or both eyes, according to the occurrence of this keratoconus in which eye. There is usually a frequent spectacle changes and usually the patient is not satisfied with his vision with the spectacles. There is a contact lens intolerance as well for these patients. The uh, signs shows uh, on uh, corneas of keratoconus, usually uh, you can find vox stri, which is usually parallel to steep axis, prominent corneal nerves, and decreased sensation, especially in the fear part of the cornea, Flesher ring, which is the deposition of iron on the epithelium of the cornea, uh, monsoon sign, and acute hydrops in late stages, where the dismiss membrane rupture introducing the aqueous inside the cornea, causing edema of the cornea. So, just to be aware of the keratoconus, you have to know it's, it's not a disease which uh, is uh, only uh, related to refraction. It's a weak cornea and associated with refractive error. So we have to treat both sides, the uh, weak cornea and the refractive error of the patient. And there is no single 
procedure or maneuver right now available to correct both of them. If you go deeply in the tissue or the cells of uh, keratoconic eyes, you can find, as I said, uh, a classic triad, the iron deposition in epithelium, fleshier ring. In Bowman's membrane, there are breaks usually in the, this Bowman's membrane, and usually an irregular basement membrane of the epithelium cells causes fibrosis to fill these gaps in the Bowman's membrane. As well, there is stromal thinning. At a late uh, onset, there is the Desmet's membrane breaks or hydros. Confus can confirm this as well by showing uh, uh, changes in the epithelium with the cornea with distorted elongated cells, as you can see here in the slide, oblique direction, cellular borders are not clear uh, in the epithelium of keratoconic patients, and missing, missing areas in the basal epithelial cells. In Bowman's membrane, you can see ruptured area, which are usually missing and replaced by fibrosis, highly refractile scar tissue later on. In the stroma, you can find the microstriae, which is present in the whole stroma or in the affected part of the cornea. And it extends for, from the anterior part of the stroma till this membrane. And it can be shown as vertical, horizontal, oblique, or reticular. Vox stri can be present as well in the posterior part of the stroma, and there is an increased reflectivity from the confuscan in the anterior part of the stroma. In the stroma, if there, are, there is high drops, it usually appears as scar tissue, fibrosis, and in the endothelium, the changes are usually increase in the size or uh, decrease in the density of the cells, change in the morphology, the shape of the cells of the endothelium, uh, and increase the cell uh, area. In keratoconus advanced case, you can see that the keratocytes density are abnor and abnormal keratocytes morphology are present, and the corneal apex shows needle-shaped refractile structures as well. We have a lot of uh, advances in the uh, investigations that we are doing for patients with uh, keratoconus. As you can uh, know that, that uh, before we can see the oil droplets reflex from the direct ophthalmoscope, by the retinoscope you can see the scissoring reflex. And uh, with the keratometer you can find an irregular Myers. And with the Blesido disc we can see a closer rings inferiorly and this is based on the video keratography studies later on. Usually the corneal thickness is thinner than normal, although a lot of patients of keratoconus have uh, within normal corneal thickness. But usually the thickness uh, of the cornea is less than 500 uh, micrometers. Of course, you can see the bacometry map in the uh, topography done for the patients. And usually there is a 30 microns difference between the superior and inferior part of the area affected. According to the uh, uh, keratography or topography of the uh, cases, you can further subdivide them into subclinical cases, which is called the form frost keratoconus, where the refraction is not that much affected, although you can see the manifestations over the topography, the increase in the steepness of the cornea inferiorly. Clinical keratoconus can be divided into two parts, peripheral uh, cornea, which is affected in 70% of the cases, and sometimes the central area of the cornea is affected uh, in two shapes, central asymmetrical bow tie or symmetrical central steepening. Again, the apex of the cone is usually inferiorly, although I saw a couple of patients who had a superior uh, keratoconus, which is superior to the visual axis. Of course, you have to adjust your uh, topography, the scale of the topography, so that it can be uniform for all patients, so that they can e easily detect cases of keratoconus. And uh, you can notice always that the hot spot or the most prominent part, ectatic part or steep part of the cornea, is not at the six uh, o'clock uh, uh, presentation. And, of course, you have to be aware of the skew deviation, which increase difference between the both superior and inferior meridian by more than 15 degrees. 
because a lot of theories showed that the posterior part of the uh, cornea might be affecting, uh, affected first in keratoconus patients. Again, a posterior elevation map might be helpful, and you can divide this according uh, to the uh, different studies into uh, a, a normal one, which is less than 17 micrometer posterior float, suspicious, which is between 17 and 20 micrometers, and pathological or a real keratoconus, which is more than 20 micrometers in the posterior float. One of the machines which was developed to uh, show the stre uh, strength or uh, tensile strength of the cornea, and it was supposed to be very helpful, the uh, aura, the ocular response analyzer, but, and it was a non-invasive machine, measured the corneal biomechanical properties, which is very important to understand the area of weakness of the cornea and differences between uh, different uh, patients. But the reliability of the machine was not that much, so we are waiting for a more reliable machine. Again, I want to remind you that the keratoconus have two things, a weak cornea and a refractive error. And we have in our uh, amentarium, a lot of things that we can manage keratoconus with, either managing the weak part of the cornea or managing the refractive error as well. As you can see in this tree, RGB contact lenses, cross-linking, uh, intracornial ring segments, keratoplasty, and thickic IOLs later. What's most important that you have to follow up the patient every six months to see the progression of the patient even if he did or did not do any of the uh, things that we have uh, mentioned. Last steps, especially in our area, we have to be keratoconus minded. We have to think about keratoconus all the time. If you have a high astigmatism, and the best spectacle corrected visual active of the patient is not reaching 2020, and we have a thin cornea, we are always suspecting this case to be keratoconus, and we have to follow this patient in a close uh, interval so that we can prove that he is keratoconus or not. And RGB contact lens trial is a very important issue, not only to improve the vision of the patient, but also I feel that it is very important as a diagnostic uh, tip for keratoconus. Again, we have a lot of uh, uh, different operations and maneuvers that we can do with patients with keratoconus, and we are talking about, uh, in this session, about the uh, common things or the advances or the most recent things that are done nowadays. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Tom. Okay, so we'd like to... Okay, so we have the second speaker, Dr. Elsmai, working at Far Eastern Hospital from Taiwan. And her topic is the RGP option for keratoconus. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I'm honored to be here to present to you the options we have today in the field of RGPs. I have uh, no financial disclosure, and I'm sure we're all very familiar with these signs of keratoconus. Um, there's the two types of uh, the keratoconus, the central nipple cone and the inferior sagging ones, and we have the recent uh, uh, update tours of tomographic versus the past, we have the topography. So the, the key is the back service in keratoconus. And um, this is the five steps that we can manage uh, for a keratoconus, and we can see that the contact lens is, is very important in the second step. And so if divided by risk, there's a high risk group and a low risk group. How for high risk and risk of progression, we go on to do the cross linkage first, and then we go on to give the, uh, the RGPs in the contact lens. In the low risk group, we rehab the patients with the contact lens. Okay, so the goal of contact lens fitting in keratoconus is to improve visual acuity with comfort, and then we try to delay or obviate the surgery part. So what non-surgical options do we have? 
actually we have a spectacles, soft contact lens, historic contact lens, and the RGP Rose K family. And then we have the piggybacks and hybrids, a mini scara lens and full scara lens. So actually we have quite a lot of options. These are the types of contact lens uh, versus diameter. See, so we have the cornea GPs around 10 millimeters, and then the soft lenses go out, goes out to 14. The scale lens families goes out more than 15. So this is two cases that we have in uh, five years ago that we have um, post-LASIK um, ectasia, and this one case we used the soft toric contact lens, and then these uh, the. The, the other way, we use the traditional four-curve rigid contact lens. So for the Rose K and uh, RGP cornea lenses, um, the management uh, is like this. In US, there is maybe epidemiology, it like is one in 2000. So the load of uh, public health is very big. And so contact lens is still the best treatment for a large majority of the keratoconus patients. And RGP has been the choice for years. But um, discomfort, staining, scarring, okay. So what type of lens can we, ha can we choose? There is the multi-curve um, lens like the Rose K, with the, which is good for the central nipple cone. And we have the intralimbal lens that's with larger di diameter ranging between 10 to 12 for the low sagging cones. And then there's the pig piggyback contact lens which uh, the RGP is piggyback on the soft contact lens. We have photos later. And then we have the hybrids and uh, the scara and mini scara. So for RGPs, the fitting philosophy is um, there's three types. Um, the first is the apical clearance and then the apical bearing and then three point touch or divided standards. Uh, so this is the apical clearance. See, the central or the cone is clear. And then this is the apical bearing where the center of the cone is bared with the, the load of the contact lens. And this is the three point touch with the center and the peripheral is bearing the weight of the contact lens. So in the Clark study, <coughs> um, there's a 38% incidence, incidence in eye steeper than 52 uh, diameter wearing uh, RGPs, which means the contact lens wears doubles the risk of scarring in the cornea. So with steeper cornea curvature and flat fitting lens, we have an increased risk of cornea scarring. So this is one of my case, and we have, um, after a long-term wearing of RGP, we have a central uh, cone um, scarring. So basically fitting, we all like this, um, with a, a feathery touch to the cone and then the peripheral touch, but most of the time it ends up like this with the very heavy uh, bearing on the, on the cone. <clears throat> so that's why we try to use others, like the piggybacks. This is the RGP piggyback on the uh, soft contact lenses. And there's a hybrid lens that is a silicone uh, skirt. Like th this is the RGP center with a silicone skirt on the outside. And this is uh, one uh, they call Dewart with the skirt in the, uh, in the peripheral and the central RGP. Oh. And this is another design of the hybrids called the clear, clear cone and where the bearing is on the conjunctiva and scara and it votes over the, the cone of the cornea. So there's um, the votes, which is here and doesn't touch the cornea central zone and the outer landing zone and the inner landing zone. So we, this is the outer landing zone and this is the inner landing zone. So the feathery touch in the inner landing zone touching the uh, limbus and the outer is um, outside in the scara. And so then we have the bigger scara lenses. Um, <clears throat> so the scara lens family uh, classified by the bearing and the clearance uh, there's uh, four types, the cornea scara, which is about 13 millimeters, and they bear the cornea and the limbus. And there's the semi scara, which is around 14 to 15. And then there's a mini scara, which is by 15 out, and the full scara, which is 18 to 24, which is pretty big. So these fitting pr principles are just a gentle uh, vote and gentle touch to the cornea, and we vote over the limbus and land on the scara. 
So this is fitting by the sagittal depths. So we see that um, two corneas, are both 44 diameters, but the, um, so they're equal case, but they sometimes have very different sagittal depths by this OCT image. So you see this mini sclerodent design, and where the central optical zone clears the apical, and then the mid peripheral limbus area and the landing zones are completely vote over the limbus and align with the scara. Okay, so this is the big one, the big um, full scara lens that which goes out like 18 to 22. So basically the fitting techniques is fit by sagittal depth, but we start by a trial lens that is steep enough to rest on the scara and completely vault the cornea. And then we selectively, progressively fat, flatten the lenses until um, the, the, uh, just a minor touch to the cornea. That's how you fit the, uh, the scar lens. But then you would have to go on and see it lands on the conjunctiva. So there, there would be some, uh, if it's too fit, uh, too steep, then it would cause some kind of edema to the conjunctiva and you compress on the conjunctiva. So the vessels would uh, bleach out. So it causes some limbo edema and a suction is very difficult to remove. So uh, to remedy is to increase the center junction of thickness. Okay. This is the Rose K uh, XL, the cornea scara lens with different edge lift. There's five of them, so you can choose. And if you have a glaucoma case with a, a keratoconus, then you can even uh, custom made with a notch around the blab. Okay, so this is the notch and this is the blab. You can use it. Okay, so this is my case. Um, I have a 40, a 40 years old female patient coming in with uh, both eyes, a keratoconus, uh, with poor vision. <coughs> she failed the RGP um, uh, trial because of poor vision. Uh, we tried uh, um, for with RGP first, and the vision was only 0.6 and 0.8, but the patient do not like the RGP. So we go on to the scara lens fitting, and it end up good vision, and it's uh, 1.2, 1.2, it's like 2010, 2010, two years out. So this girl came in, the devote skewer and the flesher ring here, and this is the, uh, her staging and presentation was A4, B4, C2 with the pantacam staging. And we tried the RGP, but the, this is the RGP of fluorescent simulation on the Pantacam, and we see a three-point touch, <clears throat> but she doesn't like the, the RGP. So um, this is the uh, Antirsimen mini scara lens fitting program that we had. We uh, basically put on the scara lens, the trial lens, and then we go on to do the Antirsimen OCT. So we see that um, this is the right after the putting on, and then this is after 40 minutes after the RGP, the, the scar lens settled. So uh, there's just a feathery touch. This is 49 micrometers. And the uh, fluorescent screen uh, looks good. So the scar lens totally vote over the cornea, providing good vision and comfort. So here is my uh, acknowledgement. Uh, the, a lot, most of the slides come from uh, my OD and my colleagues, uh, 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 Mr. Ong, Dr. Ong. So thank you for the nice weather. And uh, but please don't forget about the injustice happening in this world currently. This is Hong Kong, and the garbage they're selling to our childrens. This is another um, um, well, we can call it scare lens, and he got it from Taobao Wang, which is uh, we cannot do anything about it in, from Taiwan. But we're very sad that it happened. Thank you. Any question? <clears throat> Thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are treating uh, a, a disease which has two aspects, a weak cornea and a refractive error. And I think RGP, as you mentioned, is a very important tool in correcting the vision of the patients with uh, keratoconus. So uh, uh, what's the number of satisfaction of patients uh, in your practice that they are satisfied with keratoconus and for how long? Can they use it for uh, three years, five years, or whatever? 
Uh, basically, we give the patients with the keratoconus first try is mostly RGPs because RGP is cheaper in Taiwan and people have economic problems. So we, but those uh, that is steeper with a big cone like 50 something, they sometimes, most of the time, rose K is not good enough. So we try with the normal RGP, we goes on to the rose K and then we goes on to the scara lens. So I would say like around 60% would be unsatisfied. Can, can I just ask, um, um, you mentioned in your talk about uh, going up the stage of the lenses. So um, how often do you check, say, somebody's in their mid-20s for disease progression if they're coming with lenses? And how long do you advise them to keep off lenses when they're undergoing topography scanning? Uh, can you repeat the last one? So if you're going to, so the, the people are seeing well with the contact lens, but to do a, a good quality scan, often we advise the patients to keep off the lenses so we can get a good topography or tomography uh, scan done. Oh. So, that, so how long do you advise them to keep off lenses? Uh, you mean the warp issue? Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. We normally, if it's a RGP, you don't, if it's RGP, would, we would ask the patients to stop like for at least two weeks. But if it's scara lens, you don't need to because the scara lens totally vote over the cornea, so it doesn't make any difference to the cornea. So for RGPs where you have the apical touch, then you have to stop it for a, a week or two. But with scara lens, no, no stopping. Just take off the lens and then you can do it. Okay. Thank uh, you. I have a question for John. Yeah, yep. we have uh, eight uh, post -lace basic ectasia. Yeah. And uh, seven uh, uh, have the RGP welding very well for last uh, 10 years. Only one goes to the, you know, uh, the PK. So mm -hmm. I would like to know what's the percentage uh, of the patient post LASIK ectasia welding the RGP. So I, I, so it's, I, I think LASIK ectasia is different to keratoconus management. Uh, yeah, but I, I can take the question. you have the advantage of, so I will, uh, my patients, if I, if, I, if I get referred for ectasia, I will cross link them all, and then I'll fit them all with RGPs, because I think that the RGP also has a mechanical effect of maybe slowing down the, any sort of rate of progression, but normally I'll cross link them first, and then I'll put them into RGPs. And Generally, if you do that, you can avoid doing keratoplasty unless it tells you it's very severe. And I found that just doing that, I haven't, the very few I had to do any dark or procedure on, and they, the most of them could get pretty good vision in that way. Okay. Now, can I make a comment? Yeah. Actually, after reviewing a lot of paper, there was a consent going on uh, with the, uh, uh, there's a paper with the consents. And so in 2015, I think uh, a lot of people think that it, the RGP is not doing anything for the progression. So in his series, he mentioned that he had the seven of the case. I looked at it, and um, most of them are actually progressing. So the, all of them are on RGPs, but most of them are just progressing. Even the ones that they claim they, they're not progressing in uh, a time of like uh, three or four years, you would probably see uh, some kind of thinning and progress. So I, I'm, I think uh, that RGP is just, the, the use of RGP to stop the progress is just uh, short term. Yeah. It's like a warpage issue. Yeah. Yeah. So they it's, have to be cross -linked. I mean, there's no yeah. issue with that. Yeah, I agree with that. They have to be cross yeah. yeah. Great, okay, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, just because uh, we are sorry, we uh, are missing uh, John Canelopoulos talking about the cross-linking and the um, PRK. So instead of uh, losing this important point about uh, cross-linking in uh, keratoconus, I think we can uh, just uh, uh, inform the audience about the benefits of cross-linking in general and the uh, work of John Canelopoulos as uh, doing cross-linking and PRK. So from my point of view, the, as I mentioned, uh, a keratoconus is a weak cornea and having a refractive error. Patients are coming for his refractive error, not because his cornea is weak. We are detecting that his cornea is weak. And I don't think that there is another solution to protect against progression of the keratoconus except by doing cross-linking. But on the other hand, we have to give the patient a solution for his vision. It's not enough to cross-link the patient 
uh, cornea so that we stop his progression and leave him without any refractive correction. So uh, I'll ask Jot first. In your cases, when you decide to do cross-linking of the patient, of course, we all do the uh, refraction of the patient, and later on, because if even uh, especially when the patient is having high irregular astigmatism, you will do him RGB contact lens. So cross-linking is number one for you, correct? Yeah. In early cases. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, it varies a little bit from country to country and, and um, issues with insurance and uh, rebate. We don't generally, I mean, generally I'd like to show some sort of evidence of progression of the, of the, of the case as well on repeated, um, uh, I mean, normally we will use uh, tomograms, you normally use shine fluke uh, imaging to show some progression of the cone and um, to really look at the posterior flow. And as long as we show some progression, maybe a couple of scans over like basically six month time period, then we will basically go in there and, be, and then we will basically uh, cross-link the patients. In some institutions, I mean, the incidence of keratoconus in the Middle East is way higher than, say, in Singapore, for example. Um, and I know the threshold for cross-linking is slightly lower, but like you said, there's no treatment apart from keratoconus to basically stop disease progression. And but the other point to bear in mind, which I also counsel the patients, is, is that if you look at the studies for keratoconus, it's not that it's going to prevent the progression in 100% of people. You're going to basically reduce the number of people that are going to basically progress, so you're going to have a proportion that they're going to be your non-responders. So it's very important those patients still get regular follow-up. And I've done DOLC and these patients as well that have progressed after they've had basically cross-linking done. So you're telling them it's an odds ratio. You're reducing the chance of them of having to have progression, but it's, you don't eliminate it. That's great. What about you, Zerk? Okay. In uh, Taiwan, uh, what do you, uh, what do you do? FDA, Taiwan FDA did not approve the uh, cross-linking for the treatment the mm -hmm. cornea uh, disease treatment. So we do not have this kind of experiences. However, we have a PRK. And I think uh, very few uh, candidates for the PRK. And it seems the result is good. But it has some criteria, of course. Yeah. I, I would like to ask uh, what your PRK experience is. Well, actually, uh, for me, uh, I don't do a lot of PRKs with cross-linking. But it's only very selective cases, not like uh, John Canelopoulos and others in, around the world. Uh, because the nature of, uh, as we told, the nature of the progression of the disease is different in different parts of the world. I think in our part of the world, the progression is very high. And uh, PRK with cross-linking will not improve the vision to a satisfactory uh, level of vision, as well as uh, stability of the cornea. So I do a, lot, a little uh, less numbers of PRK cross-linking. Mm -hmm. Cross-linking is a very important issue. I do it for uh, all patients, especially early cases, but providing the patient a way to correct his vision, either glasses, RGB contact lenses, or thinking about uh, rings before even doing the cross-linking. So what's the relation mm -hmm. between doing the rings and cross-linking, do you think? Well, I mean, again, rings are to try to improve visual rehabilitation. The rings don't stop progression. So it's, it's another, it's a method in the armamentarium of trying to improve uh, visual rehabilitation. But, you know, a lot of, if you look, even if you look in the literature, a lot of patients who do have rings still have to wear an RGP contact lens afterwards to basically be able to see well. Um, and that's, you know, still one of the issues that you have to then deal with with, uh, with the patients. That's great. Uh, in my point of view about the rings, uh, that we are doing the rings to reshape the cornea, to decrease the amount of irregular astigmatism so that we can provide the patient with a, a, a refraction which is very satisfactory to him. It will not be fully correcting the vision, but at least we can do something for the patient to enable him to see in a good way. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, in Taiwan, we have a very special condition that we are not allowed to do the keratol, uh, the cornea cross linkage. So we have a lot of uh, back loaded uh, case with uh, progression up to very large case. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we would really want happy that the scar lens came out, so at least we can rehab these kinds of patients. But we really want to know if there is any um, like a, uh, pros and cons. Uh, the, the pro side of the cross linkage is we know that it stabilizes the cornea, and but is there any uh, back back uh, the con side, the back side of the uh, cross linkage? We want this information in order to lobby to our government in order to 
uh, make possible the cross linkage in, yeah, in Taiwan. So Is it covered in Singapore? Do you have any side effects? So send the patients to Jud Mehta or me. In <laughs> oh, okay. We send the patient to Hong Kong for cross linking and come back for yeah, PRK. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they are lucky in Hong Kong. Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Gamali again. He's going to be talking about uh, the use of phakic IOLs in uh, keratoconus. Thank you. So, again, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, refractive part, uh, corrected, uh, correcting the uh, refractive part of the patients with keratoconus. When can we do phakic IOLs to patients with keratoconus? So, uh, we know that phakic IOLs in general are done uh, when uh, the, the patients, we cannot do laser refractive surgery. So they have to be seeking refractive surgery, correcting his, their uh, prob vision uh, problem. They have to have a stable refraction and their cornea, they are not suitable for laser refractive surgery, having an abnormal cornea or for professional and cosmetic needs. This is phakic IOL in general. Again, keratoconus, I always insist that uh, in our area, we are keratoconus-minded. We are thinking all the time about keratoconus, high astigmatism, uh, RGB contact lens, uh, vision improvement, and the best corrected vision is not reaching uh, 2020 with thin corneas and irregularity in the corneal shapes. So the problem is, again, a weak cornea and the refractive error. We usually follow the patient six, every six months, and we have a lot of uh, ways to manage the keratoconus. Fakic IOLs, uh, in my uh, practice, usually I'm doing it in one of these cases. If the keratoconus is stable per se, which is very rare, but some cases exist like this. They are stable without any progression for a long time. Uh, patients who have crosslink, and we usually are expecting that the uh, cornea is stable for at least two years, and the refraction is stable and giving the patient a very good vision. After cases of intracornea ring segments to correct the residual uh, astigmatism, which is not irregular anymore, and after patients with keratoplasty, and we have other patients uh, or cases in the uh, queue. So usually, phakic IOLs in keratoconus patients uh, to correct the residual refractive error, we have to have a stable refraction for at least two years, stable topography for at least one year, clear central cornea, there is no scars, no uh, post uh, uh, high drops or something like this, and the patient have to have a realistic uh, understanding that his vision will be corrected to his best. It's not necessary to be 2020. If it is not a stable refraction or topography or uh, the best corrective visual activity on the patient is expecting more, usually I'm not doing it. So, phakic IOL uh, uses, use, uh, used uh, usually in cases with abnormal corneas like these cases. I'll show you some of the cases. This is a 32 years uh, male having glasses used, and you can see that his vision is improving 2020 with both uh, eyes, and he have a compound myopic astigmatism, and his corneal thickness is fine. His topography for six years didn't change. There is a steepening in the inferior part of the cornea, and it's not changed for six years. You can see the different refraction uh, six years apart, and this patient, usually I don't recommend and I don't do laser refractive surgery, even with uh, cross-linking. So my first option in this case is, will be phakic IOL. This, this is another case when you can find the patient, again, can be corrected to 2020, compound myopic astigmatism with thin cornea. Topography showed this inferior steepening in the area, uh, both eyes of uh, the patient. Again, for, for this patient, if, we, if I do laser refractive surgery, I might evoke the progression of this uh, weak area of keratoconus, so the best option to do for him is fake IOL. Uh, this is a patient who had already cross-linked his cornea for uh, uh, stopping the progression, and I followed up the patient after the cross-linking for 12 months, and you can see that the vision is improved to 2022 in the right eye, 2025 in the left eye, and 
uh, a thin cornea with uh, typical topographic changes uh, showing a keratoconus in both eyes, maybe more in the left eye than the right eye. Uh, another case of a central uh, keratoconus, again done cross-linking, uh, a little bit mi mild myopic astigmatism reaching 2020, a little bit thin cornea. You can see the central area of uh, steepening in both uh, corneas of the patients. Uh, so this is, uh, again, a good candidate for uh, keratoconus. Pellucid marginal degeneration is another variety of keratoconus. And this patient was followed up for two years. There is no change in the topography. There is no change in the refraction. The vision is reaching 2020 with thin cornea. As you can see, the clue shape effect uh, on the topography. Uh, again, I think it is the best option for the patient to do ficic IOTs. Sometimes I'm doing what's called the triple procedure, where I do rings first for the patients, then following up the patient for three months to be sure of uh, a refraction of the patient, and that the patient is satisfied with the refraction, then I'll cross the patient, uh, uh, cross-link him, f and follow up again him for a year, and then the residual refractive error, I can do him fake IOL. This is a case where uh, the patient had uh, rings and cross-linking outside my facility, and she came complaining of defective vision. She said I did the operation, but I, again, I didn't improve. I told her because this operation was not meant to improve the vision. So I can, you can see that her vision is uh, getting to 2025 in the right eye with high myopic astigmatism, 2028 in the left eye. Thickic IOL will be a very good option for the patient for correcting the vision uh, uh, after being sure of stabilization of the condition, both in uh, topography and uh, refraction wise. This is an interesting case. I had this patient, she uh, has a, a mild or near moderate myopic astigmatism, 2020, thin cornea, but it's a very steep cornea. You can see that the uh, K reading is reaching 50 in both eyes. It's a whole topography uh, uh, steepening. I'm not happy doing laser refractive surgery for this patient. As I mentioned, post keratoplasty, we can do laser refractive surgery over the cornea after removing all the sutures and being sure of stability of refraction. But again, if the amount of refractive error is a little bit high, cannot be uh, done with laser, I think thickic IOL will be a good option. So thickic IOL can be used when no other laser refractive procedure can be done in keratocon uh, conus cases, be sure of the uh, keratoconus stability, both refraction and topography, spend time to get the best refraction for the patient and the best corrected visual acuity for him, use all available options to get the best visual outcome for uh, this patient, and continue follow up this patient for six months. Thank you very much. Questions? Answers. Just, me, uh, just uh, one point. The if you so if you, uh, you you can tell from your, your your cases that the best corrective visual acuity of the, all those patients was was twenty twenty or twenty twenty five, which is obviously yeah. an important uh, point. Um, do you counsel them on, on the fact that it's still going to have a lot of aberrations because you're trying to um, correct a, basically an irregular cornea with a regular lens? So you, they're still going to have the induction of the aberrations from their irregular, basic, <coughs> irregular surface. And do, would you cross-link every single patient uh, preoperatively, prophylactically, or what do you, what do you tell them to do in that? Cross-linking is out of discussion. I'll do cross-linking for any case of keratoconus, but I'll, I'll have to find a way for this patient to see a good vision. For patients who had cross-linking already, yeah. I follow up them. And if I found that the refraction is stable with the topography for one to two years, and if the patient is satisfied with this best corrected visual acuity, even if it's not reaching 2020, 2025, 2028, 2040 in some cases yeah. I have done, I can do him fakic IOL. And as regards to your first point that you have an irregular uh, shape of the cornea plus an irregular uh, the the, uh, the thickic IOL, the toric thickic IOL we are using, yes, the patient might have some problems as regard this, but at the end, the patient will be happy with the 
quantity of vision that he yeah. has. The important issue that I found in most of the cases, uh, post keratoconus especially, and post keratoplasty, that centration, not only orientation of the phacic IOL, because usually it's a toric one, yeah. the centration is very important. Yeah. Sometimes you are putting the phacic, toric phacic IOL in a good position, but it is a lit, little bit decenter than the uh, point that it should be there. And this will create a high order aberration. Yeah. And f most operatively, I do for the patient some investigation to see the orientation of the phacic IOL and the relation between the phacic IOL and the corneal apex. Yeah. And sometimes if the patient is complaining, I might change the centration to reach a little bit less uh, uh, quality problems yeah. related to his vision so sometimes. Just, so just on that point, um, do your axis, do you go for the ref uh, corneal refractive axis or do you go for the manifest refraction? Manifest refraction. If there's a difference. Manifest refraction. Okay. In corneal refractive axis is not uh, reliable. Yeah. Okay, in your study, uh, do you check the endocidian count? Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. And what are you finding? Well, actually, usually keratoconus patients, they are not affected a lot with phacic IOLs, not like normal uh, patients. And the rate of uh, decrease in the endothelial cell count is much less even than the patients with normal corneas. Okay, UAE. Uh, so which you prefer, uh, with the uh, phacic IOL or with the RGP fitting? <clears throat> Again, <laughs> this is a very uh, nice question because, yes, we are. I'm, I'm stuck with the patient when he comes seeing me for first time. First time, when a patient is diagnosed as keratoconus, I put in my mind that I'll do him cross-linking, and I insist that he go to do RGB contact lens trial. Even if the patient to tells me that. I will not or I cannot use RGB. I tell him, try it. Because the improvement of vision with the RGB contact lens is magnificent. So sometimes patients are encouraged more after putting the RGB contact lens. Then I'll tell him, okay, we are treating two things. For the weak cornea, I have to do cross-linking. For the vision correction, I'll do you RGB contact lens. Again, Follow up the patient. Sometimes after two, three, four years, the patient will be RGB contact lens intolerant, especially in the, uh, the uh, climate and weather in the uh, Middle East. It's very high, uh, humid and uh, uh, hot and uh, sandy. So patients get a little bit intolerant to RGB contact lens. At that point, according to his refraction, I decide to divert him either for rings, which I don't encourage a lot, or uh, phacic IOLs if the vision uh, or the best corrected visual acuity is coming for a satisfactory level for the patients. Or, to tell you the truth, frankly, 50% will do keratoplasty at that. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, the next speaker we have the uh, Jod Meta from United States, and his talk is about keratoplasty techniques and results. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be talking about uh, the use of keratoplasty in uh, specifically in uh, keratoconus. These are my disclosures. They don't really pertain to what we're going to be talking about. So despite the resurgence of lamellar keratoplasty over the last uh, two decades, um, the choice of using lamellar keratoplasty or penetrating keratoplasty in the situation of keratoconus is always basically very controversial. And this is because if you see from this graph over here, the results of keratoconus for doing a penetrating keratoplasty are actually pretty good in the long term and actually has the best survival for the graphs. On the other side, you could really think that keratoconus is an ideal surgery for lamellar keratoplasty because, of course, the disease is primarily in the stroma, as you heard from Tamara's talk. The endothelium is healthy. The patients are generally young, the ones that need to have transplants. It is an extraocular procedure. There's less risk of rejection. There's less steroid use. And, of course, it's technologically superior to penetrating keratoplasty. If you look at our data over for 2000 to 2009, you will see the rates of penetrating keratoplasty, this line survival curve over here in blue, and lamellar keratoplasty over here in red, 
for the medical capacity almost has a survival up to 10 years of almost about 88%, while penetrating capacity starts to deteriorate by 10 years down to basically 60%. But if you look at this data in a little bit more detail and you look at subgroup analysis comparing keratoconus to post-infection scars and thinning, what you'll see is that when you compare with our own data set in Singapore from penetrating keratoplasty versus lamellar keratoplasty and keratoconus, you can see the survival up to 10 years or even 15 years is almost exactly the same. It's very difficult to differentiate the survival of the grafts. However, when you look at post-infection scarring and you look at PK versus lamellar keratoplasty, there's a clear distinction. The green line over here and lamellar keratoplasty do far better than they basically do after penetrating keratoplasty. The second point is, is that obviously you have to think about endothelial cell count in these situations. So this is the left and right eye of a 32-year-old patient. Uh, in 2004, the cell counts for lamellar capacity on this side, you can see it's about 2,688. On, the, on the, this side over here, it's about 1,436. Visual acuity is good on both sides. When you follow the same patient up for two years, you can see the dramatic reduction in the cell count and the penetrating keratoplasty eye, but of course, the lamellar keratoplasty, because it's his own cells, is still maintaining good function. Now, of course, you can still have a functioning graft with 819 cells per millimeter squared, but of course, you can, you can plan this out. This guy is only 32 years old, so sometime in the near future, when he reaches in his 40s or in his early uh, late 40s, he's going to have to have some sort of graft procedure afterwards. And this has been shown from other studies when you look longitudinally over about three years follow-up, you get this continual deterioration of your endothelial cell count, albeit in the fact that keratoconus does give you a better uh, reduction in your endothelial cell count compared to other endothelial diseases such as Fuchs endothelial dystrophy or cases of herpes simplex. So you seem to do better with, with keratoconic eyes. Now, if you, I'll just show you this paper that we published a few years back now, back about uh, looking at 136 graphs. These were all performed basically for keratoconus. 104, and this was a matched group, we're looking at 104 eyes with PKs versus 32 eyes basically in the dog group. And there are two different types of dog surgery. One is using a manual dissection technique where you leave a little bit of residual stroma, and one is basically using a, a decimase bearing technique, we call it ANWAS, basically big bubble, which is a total stromal removal. You can do the age of the, uh, of the patients in the study, about 27 mean age, and the pre uh, the post-operative astigmatism between the groups is almost exactly the same. If you look at the outcomes, however, and look at visual acuity outcomes for 2020, 2030, and 2040, what you'll see is there's a significant in better visual acuity outcomes if you can basically bear decimase membrane. You can get 45.5% of the patients were seeing uh, corrective visual acuity of 2020, which is about 28.1% in your PK group. And of course, if you leave a little bit of residual stroma, this is reduced down to 7.1%. Uh, and this is basically same for basically 2030 and same for basically 2040, where it seems that the patients that have a total stromal replacement seem to do better in the longer term. And of course, this is because you get much better alignment of your graft on the posterior surface as well as the anterior surface if you able to completely replace the stroma, as opposed to what you see at below over here, which is a conventional penetrating keratoplasty, where often you'll get a ridge on this side over here between the graft host junction. But if you look at the other outcomes of the study and you look at rejection, epithelial complications, radiation shock pressure, cataract, and, and the need for refractive surgery, you start to get some bit more clarity in the differences in the results. And of course, DOLC does better in a lot of these complications because of course we used to use the steroids much less postoperatively than we do need to do in penetrating keratoplasty. Of course, the risk of allergenic rejection is much higher in PK compared to DOLC, and likewise the risk of inducing raising shock pressure or the requirement for cataract surgery. So to look at this in a bit more detail and look at from rep more representative countries, there's a systematic review that looked at 18 studies, two RCTs, with almost 965 dog eyes and 2,402 PK eyes. And these are all graphs that have been done for basically for keratoconus. The issue with the studies is that there is a variation in technique. Some are decimase bearing, some are non-decimase bearing, but there are no high drops cases in the dog series. These were all based in the penetrating keratoplasty group. And the main primary outcome measure was basically looking at best corrective visual acuity at six months. The secondary outcome measure is looking at visual acuity at 12 months, unaided vision, refractive astigmatism, rejection episodes, and also graph survival. So if you look at the, uh, the, the, the data from the, all the studies which are basically listed over here on the left-hand side, I'm just showing you the list of the countries. So it's a really true representative of countries from all around the world that are represented in these studies. So it's not from one, from one specific ethnic group. And these are basically the outcomes these studies were looking at. So if we look at visual acuity data, you'll see that there's a slight favoring actually penetrating keratoplasty over lamellar keratoplasty with respect to giving you better visual acuity at 12 months. And this might be because of the fact, like I showed you in our previous data, it a variation of lamellar techniques can basically affect your post-operative visual acuity. If you're not bearing decimase membrane or very close to decimase membrane, then it may affect your overall visual acuity. If you look at astigmatism, refractive astigmatism, slightly favoring basically dog, keratometric astigmatism, no difference between dog and basically PK. 
If you look at basically graph rejection, obviously, as you'd expect, it basically favors dog, less basically incidence of graph rejection in dog compared to penetrating keraplasty, and likewise, endothelial cell density, as you'd expect, was higher in basically dog compared to PK. If you look at basically graph survival, however, there's no difference in any of these studies between graph survival between dog and penetrating capacity in basically keratoconus. So the evidence basically suggests that dog obviously gives you reduced risk of rejection rate, gives you better refractive astigmatism and better endothelial cell count postoperatively. However, there's no significant difference in graph survival and best corrective visual acuity. And this is primarily because of the fact that, of course, we know you can have a low endothelial cell count and your graph can be basically perfectly clear. And most of these studies are already having follow-up up, up to about five years. There are very few studies that have 10-year data or even 15 or 20-year data that we really want to look at this in a bit more detail. Of course, the, one of the key issues, as I showed you from our study, is that there are less postoperative complications. And of course, this is related to using steroids less. And given the majority of keratoconic patients are having grafts when they're younger, and of course, our lifespan is increasing now into the mid 80s, it's important to consider other things in addition to graft survival with respect to the operation of choice. Now, people always say, well, you know, maybe you can't do lamellar keraplasty on every case. So what are the cases that you basically choose to do lamellar surgery on? So we typically do them on advanced keratoconic cases, patients who are contact and intolerant, people who are unable to have cross-linking ICL or basic ICRs, patients who have previous high drops, moderate keratoconus who are high, at high risk of high drops, patients with Down syndrome or basically atopies. And these are the typical cases that we'll always try to do lamellar keraplasty on. There is a difference in technique when you're doing basically uh, a, a cone surgery compared to a non-cone surgery, and it's related to the K value. So this is a patient of mine who has a, a steep cornea of 70.1 diopters. On the left-hand side, you'll see a normal lamella surgery going on a patient with a, corneal, with a previous infection scar, and it's very easy to do the surgery with a sharp blade because, of course, the corneal keratometry is flat. However, in the cone on the right-hand side, you can see over here, the technique we can typically employ is that we basically go around the edges of the cone, first of all, to, to ascertain a plane, and then we go basically over the cone in the central e region. And it's quite important to visualize this in your head as a three-dimensional structure as you're basically doing that dissection. And in that way, using a sharp blade that you'll keep absolutely flat, it allows you to go above and then basically below the cone to allow access to the posterior stroma to allow you to get a big bubble. So here you can see we're switching the techniques from a closed dissection technique to an open dissection technique as we basically go over the cone. And remember, if you think about the side of a hill, as you go down the hill, you need to basically then change your basically blade angle to the surface. Once you basically get to the evidence at the end of the stroma, then of course it allows you access to the posterior stroma to get a big, basically big bubble to give you total stromal replacement. So there you've got access with the cannula, and then we get a basically a big bubble to remove the whole stroma. So I'm gonna just show you in the last bit of my talk uh, some dog in some difficult situations or some special situations. So typically high drops. This is a patient who had an ICR ring done that was referred to me from Pakistan. And you can see, of course, he had huge issues with glare because the ring was put right on, basically on the visual axis. This is a patient who's pseudophagic, who's basically had a cataract surgery, was unhappy with his result because it, his cone was basically missed in his keratometry. And he also basically an atope, so you have to be careful of getting suture-related infections. And this is a patient with a posterior keratoconus. So I'll show you how we basically tackle these cases. So let's start with the posterior keratoconus. This is this is a 71-year-old man who basically had his left uh, graft done in the UK in 1993. Visual acuity poor, uh, poor from basically macular scar. Bit of a mild cataract on the right side. You can see his pachymetry is 272 in the middle. And you can see this posterior bowing basically forward. And this scar basically on the OCT around the area of where the posterior bowing comes up to near the anterior part of the cornea. So the way we tackle these kind of procedures, again, you know that you're going to basically try to remove all the stroma from the peripheral area, first of all, and then work your way into the center. Now, of course, if you go straight to the center here, you know you're going to basically perforate because the cornea is basically so thin. So what we do is typically we work, go around the edges and I either use ultrasound or OCT in, in OT to get a a depth plane of my peripheral area of the stroma. And then what we do is we dissect all the stroma around the area to get as deep as possible. Because what you want to try to do to push that posterior cone back is make sure you've got a very deep dissection in the paracentral area. Then typically I'll put air inside the eye because so this will decompress the central part of the cornea. And once I'm happy with the dissection, we'll remove basically the central area of the cone where we know you've got a much more higher risk of basically getting a perforation then this is basically a lamella graph going on the surface, and then to help us basically even out the wrinkles, or we can go in between the interface with this blunt dissector to smooth out the interface of the graft. So this is the patient basically pre-op, this is basically what it will look like post-op. I've just seen him recently now, he just had his cataract surgery done, and he sutures out and he gets pretty good visual acuity. And you can see over here in the central area where he had the posterior cone, on the left-hand side you see pre-op, on the right-hand side you'll see his basically post-op, where we basically smooth out the level of his posterior interface on his cornea. 
This is the guy with the ICR ring, so I generally do this as a two-step procedure. I'll take out the ring as a first step, mainly because I want to make sure that there's no evidence of any perforation when the ring has been initially put in, because I didn't, I didn't know the surgeon who put the ring in basically into this guy's eye. Following basically the ring removal, after a month, I'll just do a standard, basically, lamella graft. This is a big bubble graft, uh, dog on this side over here, and he got basically good visual acuity. So hydrops is an unusual situation because, of course, following a hydrop situation, an acute situation, two things can happen to the cone. One, you can get flattening of the K readings like you can see above, or the cone can actually remain still quite elevated. But these both approaches require two different types of basically lamella surgery. If the cone basically flattens down to a regular K reading, so we use 60 as our cutoff basically over here, you can do a manual dissection basically to remove the scar. And when you put the graft on the surface over here, you will get no compression basically on the posterior lamella when the graft basically goes on if you do a very even dissection. However, if you do the same thing in a very steep K, what will happen is you'll get a basically inflection of the posterior lamella because the scar basically from the high drops is still there in place. So in this situation, the only way to avoid this basically inflection is to do a very deep dissection down to decimase membrane to see the elevation of where the scar is. And I'll show you some illustrations of basically how we do the surgery. So this is a uh, typical case of uh, high drops in a, in a young boy, basically his K readings is less than 60. In this situation over here, because his K reading you can see on this, on this uh, orb scan over here is 52.5, we're gonna basically do a manual dissection technique. You can see the scarring all the way down to basically to decimase membrane. So this will basically be a manual dissection. We'll do a layer on layer dissection, get down to basically about 50 microns um, from decimase membrane, and then we'll basically put a full lamella graph. You don't need to go basically deeper. He's a young boy. He's gonna get a good result if you're gonna get within 50 microns. Normally we'll either use ultrasound pachymetry in OT, or now we have OCT as well. So we basically will use OCT to help us with the dissection. And this is a layer on layer manual dissection. And once we basically reach down to that level, then we'll basically put the full thickness graft. So you don't wanna basically open up the area of the high drops and basically release any fluid in basically the anterior chamber. I'll just speed this up for the interest of time. So basically you carry on using the dissection and then basically once you're happy with the dissection plane, you'll either do two or basically three dissection depending on the depth. And then you stitch a full thickness uh, cornea onto the surface and that's your end of your surgery. So this is what he was looking like pre-op. This is basically what he's looking like post-op. He's got pretty good visual acuity. This is basically his endothelial cell count. This is about 3,000 on this side over here. This is five years post-op now. And if you look at his endothelial cell count, of course, the high drops eyes will always be slightly lower than basically his other eye. And the right eye has got 2,900 cells. And his high drop eyes is basically again 2,700. So they're always basically slightly lower. If the K readings are steeper though, as I showed you in that schematic, you can't basically do the same surgical technique. So this guy over here has a K reading of 68.7 after his high drop scar. You can see the scar basically in the central part of the cornea. This is the OCT showing the scarring down to basically down to, or right down to decimase membrane. So you have to warn the patients afterwards, they may not get 20-20 vision because of the scar, especially if it's on the visual axis. So this approach is slightly different because here, is no point doing a manual layer on layer dissection technique because it's, the cornea is basically too steep. So you're gonna have to remove as much stroma as possible. And we use a very similar technique to what I showed you in the previous video on that, on that guy with posterior keratoconus. So again, we know the central area over here is gonna be the risk of basically causing perforation. And so you, you leave the central area till last and we use a BSS or and dry dis, uh, a wet dissection technique to basically remove all the peripheral stroma and then work our way to the central area where we know that basically the, the the, the high drops basically scar is. So once you've removed all the stroma from the peripheral area, you can get a good even dissection plane, and that will basically prevent that posterior boning, as I showed you basically on the schematic, and pushing that basically down. Now you can see a little bit of leakage here of fluid, because of course, now I'm getting closer to the scarred area, and then slowly you work your way to the scarred area, to, to the central area where the scarring is, where basically the high drop scar is, where the decimase membrane is open. Typically, I'll put in some air. Air is great because it'll improve your visualization. It'll also decompress the eye for you, so it'll make it a little bit softer. So it'll allow you basically to remove the finer edges of the stroma, and you basically get to remove all the so uh, stromal area. And the last bit, you'll see there's a little hole there, basically in decimase membrane, so a little bit of fluid leaking from that side there. And we can basically remove this with a bit of scissors to basically remove the last bit of basically the stroma. So you can see the decimase will slightly open, but because the pressure is low in the eye, it won't extend into a macro perforation. So you can keep it as a micro perforation perforation. Then it's a full thickness basically cornea that will basically go on top and generally in these kind of techniques we will use an interrupted suture technique to control the pressure inside the anterior chamber. Once you start suturing normally I'll put a full air fill in the eye to keep the pressure eye so you keep the basically decimase membrane up against the new graft and as you can see in the video and it's important to basically remove the air bubble at the end of surgery. This is basically just show you the dissection plane. 
So this is what he basically looked like post-op. So this is basically pre-op, this is basically post-op. I've just seen him recently, he's about three years down the line now, he's maintaining good visual acuity and a healthy endothelial cell count. So in conclusion, the long-term benefit of DOLC is worth doing uh, in keratoconic patients since they're younger and people, of course, are living longer. DOLC in keratoconus does require a variation in your technique compared to non-keratoconic cases. High drops, obviously the key thing is reducing the initial sequelae. Uh, DOLC may be achieved using a combination of two techniques, a deep manual technique, non-bearing uh, decimase membrane in the, in, the eye, in the cases that have a basic K-reading of less than 60. If the K-readings are higher, you need to use a decimase bearing technique. You need to obviously warn the patients there's a higher risk of conversion in these kind of uh, cases because of the scarrings on the visual axis. They may be slightly reduced, basically, best corrective visual acuity. But of course, if DOLC is achievable, you'll benefit the patient significantly in the long term. There's a lower risk of racy rejection and a longer time uh, with grass survival. Thank you for your attention. Well, actually, what you're doing is great. <laughs> it's very difficult cases, actually, to do with Dalk in it. Uh, uh, I want to ask you something. Uh, did you try doing FEM to laser-assisted uh, Dalk? In yeah. some of the cases? So we, do, uh, so we do do that, but not in these kind of like, cases. I mean, I do it as a, we have as uh, Zima, as you know, uh, with a ZA, it has a new software program where you can basically program your tunnel uh, in basically in your dull cases, and you, we, you can program it to be about 80, uh, 80 microns away of decimase membrane. So in your standard cases now, we will attempt to basically use the femtosecond laser. It will cut the lamella plane, and it will cut the tunnel. And the advantage of that laser is that you can use the onboard OCT to help you guide basically the depth of your tunnel, so you know exactly where you are in relation to decimase membrane. That's great. And uh, do you find that the uh, refractive outcome later on differs or just to be sure of the depth, depth. that you are doing? Yeah, the refractive outcome is the same. Generally in the cones, we will always put the same size grafts. In the very steep co uh, corneas, I'll check the refraction in the other eye and I may reduce the size down by 0.25 of a diopter to get a bit more flattening effect on basically on the surface. But if you, if you use a laser or you don't use a laser, generally once you start removing the stitches, the refractive outcomes are the same. And I think at the end, the, these difficult cases, you cannot do a film to laser. In yeah, no, these ones you you couldn't, yeah, no, no. These, were, these ones will have to be done manually and stuff. Thank you very much. So our uh, next speaker will be Dr. Uh, Leonardo uh, Mastrobasca from Italy. We'll talk about a very interesting uh, new technique in a treatment uh, management of keratoconus, which is stromal implantation. So share with us your experience, Dr. Leonardo. Good afternoon, thanks a lot uh, for the board of uh, SOE. And uh, I am talking about, can I have the first slide, please? Uh, click on your name. Yes, OK. OK, sorry. OK, I'm talking about stromal lenticular addition keratoplasty, SLAC with femtosecond laser technology in intrastromal keratoplasty for coronectasia. In the last uh, 10 years, we know that thanks to femtolaser, we have a lot of options for keratoplasty, particularly in PK different shape in uh, ALK and anterior lamellar different depth and sign cuts, and the newer option like intrastromal lenticular implantation. You can see here in this post-infection scale that we have in the first part of the cornea that we perform a femtosecond anterior lamellar technique and it's possible to perform in a donor preparation and in recipient dissection text to femtolaser, custom shape, custom thickness, diameter, in uh, topical anesthesia, in uh, with minimal suture in uh, 15 minutes, uh, with the low complication rate. You can see that very easy and uh, precise. But not for dark with fentolaser, with the anterior lamellar keratoplasty with fentolaser, no, because uh, in uh, keratoconus, particular irregularity of the residual stromal bed affects visual result. And you can see here that when we not have keratoconus in non-keratoconus, we have a regular stromal bed. But when we had keratoconus, we have a irregular stromal bed and no good vision. But the real revolution in, in uh, uh, refractive surge with third generation, that is the smile, small incision lenticle extraction, because here, without excimer, laser, and without flap, 
only with <coughs> Fento. It's possible to remove a lot of myopia until 13, 14, diopsis and astigmatism. And you can see that is very important, the potential major advantage of uh, this surgery is that we have tissue because we remove tissue and this tissue is still vital because we know that with the LASIK or PRK due to excitement laser we have the evaporation, but here we have tissue. And John Meta that is present here eight years ago, first and worst, shows that it's possible the implantation of this tissue in the, for refractive or therapeutic treatments. The question is, in corneal reshaping nectasia that we have, it's possible to perform uh, this surgery because in ectasia we have two problems. First, the steeping. Second, the thing of the cornea. The problem is, it's possible to perform this surgery to stop or to advance or to ameliorate, to increase the quality and the quantity of the vision. We tried, you can see here, we built this uh, negative meniscus lenticle and uh, perform uh, a uh, pocket in uh, the high before in uh, high bank cornea, obviously, and we published it uh, three years ago, this first paper, and uh, you can see here in uh, this movie that we prepare in high bank cornea this lenticle, this meniscus, and with this uh, lenticle insert, after that we um, <clears throat> prepared the, the pocket in the cornea, we uh, insert this uh, lenticle. I repeat, in eye bank cornea. Now, you can see that we uh, have a good results because we achieved a central corneal flattening while increases thickness contemporary. And because we have two parts of this lenticle, the central part of the lenticle is very important for thickness. The periphery with the shoulder of the lenticle is very important for the flattening because uh, it's like intracorneal uh, rings. At the light of these results, uh, this procedure may be beneficial in the treatment of refractive errors or ectatic corneal disorder, such as keratoconus. And we decide to perform this technique on human. We call this technique LAC that is stromal lenticle addition keratoplasty for the treatment of advanced keratoconus, uh, all advanced keratoconus because uh, they are uh, ready for the dark the day after. You can see here that we prepare before the lenticle, then we prepare the pocket, and then we sculpted the pocket into the cornea before with fentolaser, and insert the lenticle, real time as this with interoperative OCT. Interoperative OCT is important to study the eventual the addition of the lenticle with the, <coughs> anterior, the anterior and posterior part of the pocket of the cornea. You, you can see that there is a good addition and uh, is uh, only a few minutes to perform this uh, surgery. And this is before and after one week. You can see in severe corneal ectasia. In red field. Anterior corneal topographical change in central keratoconus after SLAC. You can see the differential map. This is an example male 30 years old with keratoconus stage 4 with central apex. 20 to 100, the, the uh, visual acuity with the sphere minus seven and cylinder minus eight. After one month, after three months, 2030, sphere minus two, cylinder minus 2.5. This is before, this is after slack. Obviously, we have a significant reduction of astigmatism, you can see here the vector analysis of refractive astigmatism in SLAC, after SLAC, the reduction, obviously, of high order aberration, and the change in anterior segment of CT and pachymetry map, you can see the difference in central keratoconus, 
and this is with OCT wide field scan. You can see that you can appreciate a maximum lenticle thickness, thickness point, intrastromal pocket ticket, and this is the difference uh, with uh, uh, <coughs> intracorneal rings, because we know that with the, in, this is the morphometry, with intracorneal ring and with ZAC. We know that with the intracorneal ring, we work, we put intracorneal ring in the posterior part of the cornea that is uh, very weak, but with ZLAC, we work in anterior part of the cornea that is very strong. And this is very important for the, the stroma of the cornea and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and with the intracorneal surround ring, it's possible that we have the dislocation like the colleague showed five minutes ago. This is after 12, 18 months in slit lamp biomicroscopy. And you can see that it's very difficult to appreciate the disc here, the lamellar, the lenticle, because it's a clear and transparent, the cornea. This is the visual acuity, incorrect, a best correct visual acuity. This is the keratometry, key max and the average K, the stabilization and the <coughs> 18 months, and this is in confocal microscopy, anterior stroma, anterior lenticle interface, lenticle, posterior lenticle interface, and posterior stroma, from one week to one month uh, until 18. There's a mistake here because it's 18 months. You can see that we haven't problem about uh, keratocyte, uh, activated keratocyte uh, or scar, because uh, it is very, very tolerate this uh, uh, this. Now, we are working in coming with uh, Professor uh, <coughs> Meta, with Patricia Kochner, with uh, Professor Dua, Alio, and Guel. We are working about the decellularization of this lenticle because it's very important uh, to put into the pocket a lenticle without cells waiting the, the repopulation of the disc of the cells of the patients. Here you can see in transmission electron microscopy the control before and after that the keratocyte disappear. In conclusion, negative slack appear a feasible technique for reshaping the cornea because we have find topographical and morphological finds that indicate consistent and reproducible variation. The coronal flattening achieved with the stromal technique represent an interesting treatment option in coronal ectasia. Obviously, further studies are needed to assess the ideal profiles for achieving the best coronal remodeling in different ectasias. Tissue bioengineering for further optim optimize the procedure. It's very important, prepared mind. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. Any questions? Leonardo, how, st how um, stable do you think this is in the uh, long term? How, how stable uh, do you, is there, I mean, uh, what, what kind of cones are the best patients to basically use this technique on? Stabilization is uh, very important in this technique because uh, we, after, we have now two years, uh, to 24 months, and we haven't uh, relapses of keratoconus. And I didn't perform uh, cross-linking in no patients until now because I have a terrible experience in smile uh, with uh, uh, cross-linking because uh, in uh, three cases I published it too, I performed uh, uh, um, uh, cross-linking into the pocket, and I have uh, uh, AIDS that I, I didn't see my life uh, in a smile. And all in these three cases that I publish it because it's my fault, obviously. But uh, I, I, um, about the discussion of uh, half hours ago about cross-linking, I think that, in my opinion, cross-linking is not indicated after uh, PRK, after LASIK, after refractive surgery. I think that is only uh, possible to have AIDS in my opinion, in my opinion. For a mile, mandatory, in my opinion, don't perform. And, and, uh, what kind of uh, topography do you look for for patients suited for this uh, kind of surgery, the, the keratoconics? 
Uh, in this case, the problem is that uh, it's easy to, it's possible to perform uh, this um, slack when we are in the central keratoconus. But now we uh, changed the, the 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 position of uh, of uh, in decentration when we have a, a decentrated keratoconus. We perform a big pocket and uh, we use axis, uh, but manifests axis and non axis of uh, to obtain a good visual with the after the treatment. What about the reflected, uh, reflection both patients uh, after uh, doing this? Can you further manage this reflective outcome with other uh, no, uh, until now, no, because we reduce, uh, we have the possibility of uh, an aseconia uh, before and then we haven't, because when I reduce from 8 and 8 to 2 and 2, I have a, a good results uh, with contact lens, it's possible to correct, yeah. and I prefer don't, uh, don't perform other surgery in this corner. But uh, I think that... Uh, uh, but because we now, after two years, of 28 months now, but published it until 18, but 28 other 10 months we have in our follow-up. But I think that in the future it will be possible to treat with other technique. But um, I repeat, mm, I, I, am a, uh, I'm a, um, I don't think that is correct to perform PRK over mm -hmm. this, uh, because we have two interfaces. Yeah. A third interface uh, is, um, in my opinion, no good. On which machine do you check the, the, the end cure? Please don't. Which, which kind of machine? With kind of machine, machine I use, you uh, use. Uh, yeah. and it's possible only with uh, with. Uh, no, I I use no no it's possible only. <laughs> I use I use uh, 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 Visumax of the Zeiss oh, yes, for, yes. for this because I have this uh, instrument. But now it's possible with because for the first was this. Now it's possible with a lot of machine. I think that all are uh, good mm -hmm. in same manner. So we are waiting for the results after uh, two three years. Continue. Yes. <laughs> So, we can conclude. Any questions from the audience about cross-linking uh, uh, in general? Management, different cases, strange scenarios? So, I think we uh, could cover uh, a lot of aspects and uh, way of management of keratoconus, uh, the up-to-date now. I think that still uh, there are uh, a lot of continuous uh, work in the area and field of keratoconus, weak cornea, post lasik tasia, and uh, the development will uh, bring better results for the patients uh, and the surgeons as well. The surgeons, of course, are w uh, more concerned about the uh, corneal uh, weakness and stability and uh, correcting the refractive error and the patients as regard uh, correcting the refractive error. So I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers who were uh, with us today and uh, the uh, SOE who invited uh, us, the ISRS, to uh, present you this symposium. And thank you very much.